First, I owe everyone an apology. I wrote this script the day after Larry Storch died. Somehow it got buried and I neglected to film it. I have no idea how that happened. I came close to tears when I heard of his passing. He lived to be 99 and was the last surviving cast member of F Troop. He was truly a legend. His list of credits reads like a novel, but F Troop is what he's best remembered for. A lot of people don't know that after F Troop, Filmation created a Saturday morning show that reunited him with his F Troop pal Forrest Tucker. It was called The Ghostbusters, and it had nothing in common with the movie of the same name that came along in 1984. The show was low-budget, silly, most of the jokes were lame, and you can't help but love it because it has Larry Storch and Forrest Tucker. These two could have sat down and discussed Lint, and they would have made it entertaining. I had had this show on the back burner for a while, but in light of Larry Storch's passing, I decided to dive into it as my small tribute to one of my favorite actors of all time. The Ghostbusters consist of three partners, two humans, and a gorilla. Their names are Spencer, Tracy, and Kong. We're the Ghostbusters. I'm Spencer. He's Tracy. I'm Kong. If you're a kid on Saturday morning, you didn't see that one coming and you're hooked. And right from the start, the show landed some major guest stars. In fact, the first two people we see are the Fat Man and Rabbit, played by Johnny Brown and Billy Barty, respectively. When we must contact the spirit of Big Al. How true. And then Big Al will help us to get the thing. <laughs> Right around the time this aired, Johnny Brown landed a steady role on the hit comedy Good Times, which put him on the map. Billy Barty was unique. For the longest time, he had been just about the only little person active in TV and movies, and he was already a household name. He founded an advocacy group called Little People of America. In high school, he played both football and basketball because nobody ever told him he couldn't. He did quite well and also ran track and did some wrestling. By all accounts, he was also a very good person. I always enjoyed watching him, but when I saw this quote, I knew I really liked him. The name of my condition is cartilage hair hypoplasia, but you can just call me Billy. Using a crystal ball that looks suspiciously like a bowling ball, they start trying to raise the ghost of Big Al. As quick as they start doing the weird stuff, that's where the Ghostbusters come in. Boy, Kong, you should have seen me and Tracy at the bowling leagues last night. Right, Tracy? <laughs> well, if you two bowl like you do Ghostbusters, I'm glad I wasn't there. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, it just so happens that Tracy here bowled a perfect game. 300 pins. Well, a lot of people have done that. <laughs> With one ball? Tracy doesn't talk, but he's just as intelligent as the humans are, sometimes more so. The opening credits tell us he was trained by Bob Burns. You know how sometimes they say training really gets inside you? <laughs> yeah, you can figure out the rest. It's a nice little gag. The team gets their ghost-busting assignments from a mystery man called Zero. In a direct spoof of Mission Impossible, the messages are on tapes that are hidden in unlikely places. Getting the assignment always requires Spencer and Tracy to drive into town. And naturally, Tracy drives. Come on, give me that. This is Zero, Ghostbusters. Your next assignment is to check up on the fat man and the rabbit. Fat man and the rabbit? I wonder what they're up to. Down to. Those of us who have watched the original Mission Impossible will remember one of its most iconic lines. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. <laughs> And each time something like that happens to Tracy. The messages aren't always as clear as they could be. Ghostbusters is to check up on the ghost of Dr. <laughs> Who has 
come back to <laughs> Let's try that again with a pecan pie. The ghost Zero was talking about there is Dr. Frankenstein, played by Bernie Cobble. Most recently, we saw him in When Things Were Rotten, and later he became famous on The Love Boat. We'll see more top-notch guest stars such as Ted Knight, Jim Backus, Ina Balin, Marty Ingalls, and Anne Morgan Gilbert. Both Forrest Tucker and Larry Storch were thoroughly loved by most all the acting community, so I suspect their influence had a lot to do with it. And in keeping with what those two were best at, the show is about as silly as it gets. Dr. Frankenstein needs the brain of the most gullible person on the planet who just happens to be Spencer. After 15 to 17 minutes of goofy antics, the team will pull out their ghost materializer and finish the job. Patent pending. As I said, this show was fairly low budget, so they had to make the most of what they had. Get familiar with that hallway and all its doors because it'll appear in just about every episode and they use it for what you think, the multiple doors gag. Much like F Troop, Forrest Tucker is the brains of the outfit and Larry Storch is the other guy. He was just so good at playing a doofus. Like a lot of entertainers of the time, such as Tim Conway and Tommy Smothers, behind the scenes he was the comedic genius. On screen, he was dumb as a post. The show took full advantage of that. I mentioned Dr. Frankenstein's ghost looking for the most gullible idiot in the world and finding him in Spencer, and that trend continues pretty much unabated throughout the series. What, you cut out that cleaning business? You'd think the Queen of England was coming. You mean she's not? Alright, fellas, you can forget it. She ain't coming. She's not coming, but the Flying Dutchman is, and he wants to recruit two new crew members. He's settled on Spencer and Tracy. Fortunately, Tracy has his bag of tricks with him. Similar to Felix the Cat, he can pull just about anything out of that bag. What are you two doing, dragging an anchor? <laughs> we, could, we could run into a demon or a, a goblin or even a vampire. And then where'd we be without a stake? Not that kind of stake, a wooden stake. If that's a wooden stake, I'll shine your feet. All right. That's also where they keep the ghost dematerializer, but it only appears when they need it. The bag is like a room of requirement, only portable. As I said, Tracy doesn't talk. His favorite method of communicating is through his drawing easel, doing what would eventually become the game Pictionary. I wish I had a cold bottle of pop. Now, show me a game that can do that, and I'll show you the best-selling game of all time. Clyde Crash Cup, eat your heart out. Between the easel and the bag, he can make just about anything appear. And then there's the filing cabinet. In other episodes, he'll wrestle with a drawer until his eyeballs are about to pop out, then Tracy will casually walk over and gently open it. 
This show has Boku running gags like that, but they aren't overdone. The crew get a variety of assignments that lead them into unique situations, but somehow it always comes back to that spooky castle in the hallway with all the doors. Basically, every villain who materializes decides to use that place as their base of operations. You get the feeling that except for the little shop where they get their assignments, the town these guys live in has exactly two buildings, the one that houses their office and the spooky place outside the cemetery. But when you get right down to it, when you look at the whole premise of the show, that's all they need. Each show follows a basic pattern. Ghosts have appeared in the cemetery near the spooky castle, wanting to do something that probably isn't good for living humanity. I was thinking of that person who sent us to the great beyond centuries ago. At least you can make me a malted. <laughs> so be it. You're a malted. <laughs> The guy she's thinking of was named Edward Spencer, which is to say our man Spencer's ancestor. She's out to get revenge. In another one, Billy the Kid and Belle Star return so they can form a new cattle rustling gang. Billy the Kid, when are you gonna learn? You ain't got a horse no more. You're a ghost. Smile when you see that, Belle. Smile, <laughs> That's better, that's better. Oh. All right, you're a ghost and I'm a ghost, but but I'm a real hungry ghost. You know, a body can get mighty hungry, eat nothing but angel food cake all the time. Billy is well-known comic Marty Ingalls. He was as much at home doing stand-up, either solo or as a comedy team, as he was doing roles like this. Belle Starr is played by Brooke Tucker. She did a little acting, not much, and her primary claim to fame is she's Forrest Tucker's daughter. As an aside, I have to give the show credit. Billy the Kid wasn't a professional gunslinger. He was good with a gun and not afraid to use one, but after he wound up on the wrong side of the law, his primary business was cattle rustling, during which time he didn't inflict any physical harm on anybody. It's nice to see at least one show acknowledge that. Anyway, the Ghostbusters get an assignment from Zero related to the current problem. They go bungle around in the cemetery in the old castle until they're able to whip out the ghost dematerializer. Then they go back to the office for some finishing gags. It's formulaic, and it works. One of the most interesting things about this show, at least to me, is Spencer's outfit. He's wearing a style created in the 1930s that really became popular in the 40s and especially during World War II. A colorful suit with padded shoulders and a wide-brimmed color-matching hat like he's wearing was known as a zoot suit. In 1942, the U.S. government tried to outlaw them for several reasons. The official story was the style used way too much fabric that was needed for the war effort and was thus wasteful. Thing is, once some people got wind of that, they started attacking zoot suitors and beating them up. I, along with many other people, suspect that was the real reason for the ban. The other prominent feature of the zoot suit was a super long watch chain that usually hung down to the wearer's knee or beyond. And that was what they used it for. There might or might not be an actual pocket watch on one end of it. The chain was the important part. Twirling it made you cool. After the war, the style continued for a while into the early 50s, but didn't really catch on like it had before. And then you have your throwbacks like Spencer, who seemed to have never gotten over the phenomenon, so he continues to wear one. It's 1975. I wonder if he realizes the war is over, too. I mentioned the range of guest stars who appeared on this show. Some were already very famous, such as Ted Knight and Marty Ingalls, while others were famous for the particular niche they were in at the time. I've been telling you for years, you're past your prime, you old bat. Remember who you are speaking to, my dear. The one and only Count Dracula! Put down your arms and stop making a fool of yourself. You look like a wrinkled kite. Mrs. Dracula is played by Dina Dietrich. She was primarily a character actor, but at the time this was made, her commercials were immensely popular, and she was known for a particular catchphrase. It's not nice to fool Mother Nature. 
That just goes to show you take your fame where you can get it. And getting the chance to play off Larry Storch and Forrest Tucker could only boost her career, and I guess it did. She was in constant demand for the rest of her days. Most of the classic villains show up, including Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Thou art soothing, my muse of beauty, I am bitten by thy power. A bug! Don't move! I'll get it! <laughs> I'm dead, will you? Ooh, you got a dish, huh? Here, try some of my homemade scratching salve. Here, smell it. How? I assume I don't have to point out that in the original story, they were both the same person. Edward Hyde wasn't the giant monster we saw in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen either. He was a mousy little guy with no morals who was basically out to take Dr. Jekyll over and use his money to wreak havoc. But I can't picture Joey Ross in his Gronk outfit from It's About Time playing that character successfully. Dr. Jekyll is lamenting the fact that he ever created his Mr. Hyde formula and has no idea how it managed to split them into two persons in the afterlife. But he knows what to do about it. Whatever went wrong, I am now able to correct that situation. I can neutralize the personality splitting effects of the formula by mixing a potion containing a personal article belonging to a person who is absolutely devoid of personality. Guess who that is? I'll give you a hint, it's not Tracy. The stories usually go like that. Someone wants to make use of Spencer because he's a dimwit with no personality of his own. He's the world's biggest dupe. There's always something about him that gets the ghost's attention. Larry Storch consistently took those situations and turned them into excellent comedy. Big surprise, I know. The window in the office is another running gag. Case in point. Guess what I just bought? What? The Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> and I suppose that you're going to rebuild the Brooklyn Bridge in the alley between these two buildings. How'd you guess? Listen, Einstein, the Brooklyn Bridge won't fit in the alley between these two buildings. All right, guys, forget about it. You can tear it down. Uh, thanks anyway, pal. This was essentially the Larry Stortz show, and he did his usual amazing job. The way that he and Bob Burns and the gorilla suit played off each other looked so natural you could forget he's talking to an ape. After the initial 15-episode season, ratings were good enough to merit a second season. It was Filmation's second highest-rated show behind the Shazam Isis Hour. But rather than make a second season, the powers that used to was at Filmation decided to cancel the Ghostbusters and sink the money into their number one shows. When the movie became an instant national icon in 1984, Filmation offered to make another season slash series based on it. Columbia Pictures gave the job to DIC instead, and they produced the real Ghostbusters. Filmation was a little indignant, so in 1986, they revived this show, animated this time, under the name The Ghostbusters. In this one, we had the sons of Spencer, Tracy, and Kong, played, of course, by different actors. It ran for 65 episodes, but didn't do well, largely because it ran pretty much opposite real Ghostbusters, and audiences were more than a little confused. A number of Filmation people said in retrospect that it was a bad move that really pulled their ratings and their reputation down. Honestly, I don't know what they expected. Aside from the name confusion, replacing Larry Storch and Forrest Tucker with knockoffs is not a wise move. Granted, Forrest Tucker died in 1986, so getting his voice was a little difficult. But Larry Storch was there, and let's face it, he made the show. Tracy is the over-the-top character that nobody takes seriously, and Kong is the straight man. Spencer is the comedy in this series. It's not hard to see that the whole thing revolves around him, and rightly so. 
So if you don't have him, you're not going to have a very good sequel. I don't know if anybody reruns this show today or not, but if they don't, they should. It's crazy and delightful. The guest stars are top drawer and turn in top drawer performances. I think that's what happens when you get to perform with television icons like those two. Should it have gotten that second season? I don't know. I'm not qualified to say. I've already reviewed Shazam and Isis, and I understand why they decided to focus on those shows rather than spread the budget around and have the potential to see a second season bomb. I suspect Larry Storch could have carried another season of 15 episodes or so, but by this time he was in demand. He did 10 one-off parts in 1977 alone, and it just kept going. As I've often said, talent will show itself given the proper circumstances. Oh, did his talent show itself. He was one of those rare comics who could throw you into a laughing fit just by finding a creative way to say hello. He put all of that to work in this show and the work paid off, just as it did in everything he put his hand to. On July 8, 2022, he slipped away quietly in his sleep. We know it has to happen to all of us sooner or later, but it's always too soon. I can't really come up with any memorable words to say about him that haven't already said by people more qualified than I am. What I can do is express my appreciation, my admiration, indeed my love for this amazing man who gave us so much. I hope he's been reunited with his friend Forrest Tucker, and just as they did on Earth, the two of them are keeping all of heaven rolling on the golden floors laughing. First, I owe everybody, <laughs> those of us who have watched the original Miss, blah, 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 blah. the show gives a, the, get, get, go, get, 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 decided to cancel the Ghostbusters and think the money, <laughs> think the money, and get, get, get. much like F Troop, Forrest Toucher, <laughs> Toucher, Forrest Toucher and Larry Stork. <laughs>